Hey, if you're new to New Hope or if this is your first time, welcome. We are on a journey through the entire year. We're doing a series called This Is My Bible. And we are journeying through Genesis, through Revelation, from January to December, a different book every single week. This week, we are landing in First and Second Kings. I've asked you to do three things. The first thing is bring your Bible to church every single week, a physical copy. Let's see those Bibles. Come on, let's see them, yes. If you don't have a Bible, we have them at guest services. So you can grab one, pick one up if you don't have one. Another thing I've asked you to do is read your Bible every day. Even if it's just one verse, read your Bible every day. Reading the Bible brings life transformation in our lives. And we've heard incredible stories of people that have never read the Bible, that haven't read the Bible in a long time. Read it every day, even if it's one verse. And another thing, don't get religious about it, okay? If you miss, it's okay. Don't, get, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't say, well, I missed last week, and so, you know, there's no point. There, there is a point. Start today. If you've missed, it's okay. I've also asked you to do a, a third thing. Many of you are reading through the Bible in a year. And so, again, if you've missed a few days or you're behind, just get caught up. It's okay. Don't get crazy about it. Don't quit. Don't give up. Just keep reading, keep reading. You can find all of the resources on this series on thisismybible.io. Um, when you walked in, you received uh, message notes along with an overview. We're doing this every single week, an overview of every single book of the Bible. Today we're going to cover two books, so we're going to have to move quickly. A lot of information, so get your Bibles out, turn to First Kings, get ready. On the back side of there are the message notes for today. You can also go to the New Hope Eastlake app, and you can follow along um, under message notes as well. Um, today we will be in the book of First and Second Kings. Now, we're looking at historical content. We're going to look at some key events, meaning we're going to run through First and Second Kings, and then we're going to close out with ordinary people with extraordinary stories. Now, we've been focusing on this for the last couple of weeks, this kind of mini-series within the This Is My Bible series. And I hope you understand this, and we'll see it again um, today in these books, that the people that we've looked at so far in the first 10 books of the Bible that God has used in incredible ways, the vast majority of them were normal people just like you and I. They're everyday people who just said yes to God. And they were ready when God was what, what, what needed them in some big situation or in some circumstance. They stood up for God. They said, God, I'm available. And they were used by God. And one of the things that I want to try to get across to every single one of us, everybody in this room, everybody look at me for one second. Just everybody look at me. God can use you in great ways if you're willing to be used. These people are ordinary people that God used in incredible ways and their stories have been preserved all these years later for us. They were just like us. These are real people. They had parents just like us. They lived lives just like us and yet God used them in incredible ways. And I believe this with all my heart because we have God's spirit, God's presence within us that God can use any of us in incredible ways. So turn to 1 Kings. The historical content is in your notes. I don't really have time to go through a lot of it, but one thing that I do want to bring up because it's really important for, this, uh, for these books is remember back in 1 Samuel last week, Israel wanted a king. Up until this point, well, up until last book of last week, God had used judges to rule in Israel. They weren't kings, they weren't presidents, they were more warriors. And God would use these judges to kind of guide the people of Israel. They were spiritual leaders, but they were, all, they were also military leaders. But Israel came to a point where they said, we want to be a king. We want a king. Remember, God had told them, you are not to be like the nations around you. Remember, after the Exodus, they come into the promised land, and God says, I want you to be unique. You're a holy nation. The word holy means to be set apart for specific use. You're not to be like the pagan nations around you. You're to be different. You're to be separate. You're to be distinct. 
And yet in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people say, we want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Give us a king. And Samuel, who is the last judge, warns them, you do not want a king. We want a king. No, you don't. We want a king. No, you don't. So Samuel goes to God. God, these people are going crazy. They want a king. And God says, well, tell them this, 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 and this can happen if they have a king. And so Samuel goes back and tells the, the people, if you have a king, these are the ramifications. This is what can happen. And like we've seen God do so many times in the first 10 books of the Bible, oftentimes God will give us our way. It's not always good. Matter of fact, most of the time it's not good, especially when it contradicts something that God has already told us. But God in his infinite power and wisdom, and because we're not puppets, he gives us a free will, God says, okay, I've warned you, but you're gonna do what you're gonna do. And if you want a king, you can have a king. And so the first king that comes on the scene is Saul. And things start out okay, but then things go bad really quickly. Saul is a man after his own heart. Saul disobeys God, doesn't follow God, cares more about himself than he does following God's plan. So God replaces him with the greatest king in the history of Israel by which all other kings would be measured by, and that's David. While Saul was still king, God had anointed David to be the next king of Israel. Now, David, we saw, had a ton of flaws, but the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Saul was a man after his own heart. David, very flawed, but he was a man after God's own heart and ends up being an incredible king in Israel. And today we'll be introduced to the third king in Israel, and that is David's son, Solomon. Solomon. So we have judges, we have kings, and then what will display itself very prominently in these books are prophets. Now we've seen a few of them up to this point, but a prophet was somebody that heard directly from God. They are like the spiritual thermometer, the spiritual leaders of, of Israel. And God would speak directly to the prophets and the prophets would relay the message either to the people and in these cases, we'll see to the kings because most of the kings that come after Solomon are bad kings. So let's look at some, some key events. So turn to 1 Kings chapter 1. Verse 1, it says, Now King David was very old. Uh, tr tradition has it that David died at around 70. And it really wasn't that old for those days, but David lived a hard life. David was very old, and no matter how many blankets covered him, he could not keep warm. That sounds like my wife. Anybody else like that? David is near the end of his life, and he's in a weakened state. And we see in verse 5 that about that time, David's son, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith. By the way, in First and Second Kings, if you're pregnant or if you're looking for a name for your next child, First and Second Kings has a huge, huge choice of names. I can't promise you can pronounce them all, but there are a ton of weird names, uh, different unique names in First and Second Kings. And look at what it says about Adonijah. Adonijah, and I have this underlined in my Bible, decided to make himself king in the place of his aged father. His dad's not even dead, and Adonijah is setting himself up as king. So he provided again for himself with chariots and horses. Adonijah saying, my dad is weak, my dad is getting old, and so I'm gonna be the king. And it kind of made sense because Adonijah was the fourth son of David. His first three sons were dead, and so it was customary for the oldest son to be the king. However, when word gets out that, I, that Adonijah has basically set up this kind of mock um, um, anointing, and, and, uh, and, and ceremony to make him king. He actually makes himself king. Word gets out to Samuel, or excuse me, to Nathan, and, and word gets out, word gets out to Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, 
that Adonijah is going to make himself, he's made himself king. And so word gets back to, to, to David, and David's like, no, 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 no. Solomon is going to be the king. And so David makes Solomon the king of Israel, and Adonijah comes begging for his life, and he would live, but not too much longer. Um, Solomon in chapters 2 and 3 becomes king of Israel, the third king of Israel. God appears to Solomon twice over the next few chapters. The first time we see in chapter 3, and you probably know this story, that the Lord came to Solomon. In verse 5 it says, The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. In chapter 3, verse 5, and he said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing if God said that to us? <laughs> what do you want? Ask for it. What, what, whatever you want, I will g give it to you. And Solomon replied, you were kind to my father D David because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you've continued to be great and showed him great kindness to this day. And Solomon goes, at, goes on, and you know the story probably. Solomon asked God for wisdom. He's like, God, I'm young. I don't know how to go here or there. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to be a leader. I don't know how to judge the people rightly. I don't know how to make the right decisions. God, will you give me wisdom to be the leader that you want me to be? Because I don't know that I can do this. And look at verse 19. It says, the Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply. And he was glad that he asked for wisdom. And so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people and you have not asked for a long life, and you've not asked for riches for yourself or the death of your enemies. I will give you what you ask for, and will he ever. I will give you a wise and understanding mind, such as none, no one else will ever have before you or after. Isn't that amazing? That God would give Solomon this incredible, incredible wisdom. And boy, did God ever give him, him wisdom. Look in chapter 4. Verse 29, it says, God gave Solomon great wisdom and understanding and knowledge too vast to be measured. Has that ever been said about you? <laughs> you have more wisdom than anybody I've ever met. It's never been said of me. In fact, his wisdom exceeded, listen to this, all of the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezerhite, and Heman, the Calcol Cal uh, and Darda, told you the names are cool. So uh, the sons of Mahal, his fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. And look at what he did, verse 32. He composed some 3,000 proverbs, right? There's a book of proverbs. Solomon wrote most of them. He composed 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority on all kinds of plants, from the great cedars of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from the cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. All kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. Boy, did God ever bless him. People would come from all over to ask Solomon questions, to get help and advice from Solomon. They would send ambassadors from all over the world to talk about how amazing Solomon was and all the wisdom that he had. And Solomon was very good at making sure that this was known, that this was from God. And, and God was glorified because so many people came to hear from Solomon. Solomon would write most of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. The second time the Lord appears to Solomon is in chapter 9. Verses 1 through 8, it's kind of interesting that when the Lord, um, in verse 2, says the Lord appears to Solomon a second time, and he had done before at Gibeon. What's interesting is that, we don't have time to read it, you can read verses 1 through 8, but this time, after Solomon is on top of the world, I mean, he's going to build the temple of the Lord, people are coming from all over, 
He makes these incredible, wise choices, and people are amazed at the decisions that he can make and everything that he, know, that he knows about. He is popular. He is famous. He's trending. I mean, everybody, he's going viral all over. Everybody's coming to hear about Solomon. He's amazing. He's on, he's on the top of the mountain. And it's interesting that in chapter, uh, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, the Lord comes to Solomon a second time, and this time the Lord warns Solomon. He warns him. And he says, Solomon, make sure you follow me. Make sure you don't get too cocky. Make sure you don't become independent of me. Make sure you don't stop listening to me. Make sure you follow my paths. And you watch after me and you live for me. He warns him, if you don't, this is what God says, if you don't, I will rip the kingdom from you. It's interesting that oftentimes we think that we're most vulnerable when we're at our weakest. But that's not always true. Oftentimes we're most vulnerable after huge success. Because Satan has something to try to tear down. Solomon is on top of the world. And God says, remember who put you there, Solomon. And don't forget me and all of your success. The next few chapters, chapters 5 through 10, Solomon builds the temple. Remember, the temple had been, really had been a tabernacle. It was like a portable church and the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence of God, was literally on poles and they would bring it wherever they went. Remember the children of Israel? They would set up this ta tabernacle. It was like a portable church. And so now that they're in the promised land, David is on the throne. David wants to build God a permanent temple, not a temporary portable church anymore. He wants to build a permanent temple. But God tells him, David, you're not gonna be able to build the temple because you are a man of war, you have blood on your hands, but I will allow your son. And so Solomon, who's known as a man of peace, builds the temple of the Lord. And boy, is it magnificent. It took him over seven years to build this temple. 2,700 square feet, and it took over seven years. This temple would be double the size of the portable ta tabernacle on all sides other than the height. It was triple the height. Now, this doesn't include, you had the outer courts and all the other areas, but most estimate, and you can read the magnificence of the temple, it was incredible, estimate that in modern day money, it would have cost 12 to $15 million to build this 2,700 square foot facility. And it was majestic. Solomon used over 183,000 people to build the temple. And the reason why it took so long is because the Bible says this, that at the spot of the temple, in the building of the temple, there was no sound of a hammer. There was no sound of a chisel. There was no sound of an ax. They would prefabricate, pre-cut, pre-design all of the materials for the temple and then bring them in and perfectly piece this building together. Unbelievable. Really an absolute masterpiece. So Solomon builds the temple, chapters 5 through 10. Turn to chapter 11. Now, in your Bible, if you write in your Bible, I do, I write all over my Bible, circle chapter 11. Circle chapter 11. Because this is where everything changes. This is where everything changes for Solomon. This is where everything changes for the history of, uh, of Israel. I have in my Bible, I wrote hinge. Chapter 11 is like a hinge where the door turns. And we see Solomon's Unfortunate decline. Look in verse 1. It's amazing how, how wise Solomon was and how amazing Solomon was and all of his glory and his peace and his popularity and everything with Solomon. But look in verse 1. Area, or Solomon had an area of his life that was very undisciplined. Verse 1 says, Now the king Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's da daughter, which was his wife, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. Look in verse 2. This is important. The Lord had clearly instructed his people, including Solomon, not to intermarry with those nations. And here's the reason why. Because the women 
that they married would lead them to worship their gods. Yet Solomon insisted, he wanted his way, on loving them anyways. God, I know what you've said, but I really don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. Solomon insisted on loving them anyways. He had 700 wives. Lord, have mercy. That dude was busy. No wonder he was a man of peace. He had no time to go to war. And 300 concubines. And sure enough, they led his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship their gods instead of trusting only in the Lord his God as his father David had done. Solomon worshipped, and it talks about how he worshipped all these false gods. They say that sex has conquered more kings and kingdoms than any enemy could ever take credit for. Sex always wins. If we are undisciplined in this area of our lives, it could absolutely torch our legacy, our families, everything that God puts in our lives. Solomon started out great. Everything was good for so long. But Solomon had one area of his life that was very undisciplined, and it would cost him everything. Everything. Matter of fact, it's interesting that when Solomon comes to the end of his life, and you can read in Ecclesiastes, the wisest man ever, this amazing guy who knew everything, came to the end of his life, and this is what he says over and over in the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, 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 vanity. This guy who knew everything had got off course. He quit following the Lord and started worshiping false gods and he lost his identity. He came to the end of his life and he had no idea what the purpose of life was, what life was all about. He thought it was all pointless. It was meaningless. Jesus tells us in the New Testament that without me, you can do nothing. This man who did everything and knew everything came to the end of his life and he thought life was absolutely pointless. And this can happen to Solomon, it can happen to us. When I was in Israel several years ago, um, the walls of old Jerusalem are still up. And when you look outside of Jerusalem, there's this hill, there's these, this mountain, and they call it the mountain of abomination. That's where Solomon had housed his Wives and all of the false gods um, that were there. Look in verse 7. It says, On the mountain of olives, east of Jerusalem, he built a shrine for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Melech, the detestable god of of the Ammonites, Solomon built such shrines for all of his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing their gods. That's that mountain. It's still there. It's called the mountain of abomination is what they call it. Verse 9, the Lord is very angry with Solomon for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's commands. And it would cost him everything. Everything. David had moral failures as well, his father. But David's heart never turned away from the Lord. He never worshipped false gods. Solomon went a step further from where his dad went. Solomon dies, verses 41 through 43. He reigned for 40 years in Israel. In chapters 12 through 22, after, remember I said chapter 11 is the hinge. In chapters 12 through 22, after the death of Solomon, the kingdom is divided. Israel, who was united under Saul and united under David and united under Solomon, the kingdom is divided and would be split into two. 
And so in the end, toward the latter part of 1 Kings and all into 2 Kings, you're going to hear terms like Israel and Judah and Samaria and J Jerusalem. Israel would be split into two kingdoms. The north would be called Israel. The south would be called Jerusalem, or excuse me, J Judah. The, 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 the capital or the main kind of planning center for the north was Samaria. The main kind of key planning place or, or capital of the, of the south would be Jerusalem. And so you'll see kind of those four terms interchange. The first 11 chapters cover about 40 years and the kingdom is united. The next 11 chapters in 1 Kings covers 80 years and the kingdom is completely d divided. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And what's sad is all of these kings that come after Jerusalem in the north, all of them are evil. And in the south, nearly all of them are evil as well. The south has about eight kings that end up actually being good. And God would send prophets. This is where prophets really come into play. God would send prophets to the north and prophets to the south to try to get their hearts back to God, not only the people, but also the kings who rule. In the north, God would send Amos and Hosea and Elijah and Elisha. Many of those we're going to go through here in the next few weeks. In the south, God would send Isaiah and Joel and Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Jeremiah. And we see in the next few chapters, in chapters 12 through 15, we're, we're introduced to all of these kings, these horrible kings that would, that would further bring Israel into further and further decay and further and further darkness. And then we get to chapter 16, and we're introduced to the worst king of them all. Look in chapter 16, verse 29. You've probably heard of this guy. It says, Ahab. The son of Omri began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. And he reigned in Samaria 22 years. But Ahab did what was evil in the Lord's sight even more than any of the other kings before him. All the kings that came after Solomon were bad. But Ahab has them all beat. He is the worst of all. And Ahab had a really great wife. It's amazing that he's bad because Ahab had an amazing wife. Do you know her name? Jezebel. Why does nobody name their little girls Jezebel? <laughs> There's a reason. You'll learn about Jezebel as you read through. So just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, Ahab comes to the throne and he's worse than all the others. And then God does something amazing. God raises up this crazy wild man, this bold prophet, my favorite character in all the Bible, named Elijah. And it's amazing the impact that one godly person can have. Don't forget this, this is important. It's amazing the impact that one godly person can have when things look bleak. And boy, does Elijah come on the scene with a bang. Look in chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, who was from Tishba in Gilead, told King Ahab. Remember, a prophet's job was to confront sin, confront uh, rebellion. And he goes to the most, this guy has the guts to go to the most evil king that Israel has ever seen. And this is what he says. He says, surely as uh, uh, the Lord your God, surely as the Lord your God of Israel lives, the God whom I worship and I serve, there will be no dew nor rain during the next few years unless I give the word. So this is interesting because Ahab worships Baal. Some call it Baal, but it's Baal or Baal or Baal, whatever you want to call it. And Baal is in charge of the climate. This false God that they worship is in charge of fertility, of of rain, of, of really all the climate. And the first thing Elijah does, it's not a coincidence, he says, okay, you think your God is real? You think your God is powerful? Well, the God that I serve is the true creator of all things. And I'm telling you, there will be no rain until I say so. Matter of fact, there'll be no moisture. There'll be no dew or rain until I give word. And sure enough, there's a three-year drought to the land, just as Elijah had said. In chapter 18, verses 16 and 17, Ahab is about fed up. Him and his wife both want to kill Elijah, but God keeps protecting him over and over. 
And Elijah, or excuse me, King Ahab wants to meet with Elijah in verse 16. Look, look what it says. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet him. And this is what Ahab says. So it's you, Israel's troublemaker, Ahab asked when he saw him. Ahab thinks Elijah's a troublemaker. It's interesting that when we're in rebellion against God, when we're not doing what God wants us to do, and God sends somebody in our life to help get us back on the path, how oftentimes we see them as the enemy when they're not. God had raised Elijah up to get Ahab back on track, to get Israel back on track, and Ahab sees him as an enemy. But Elijah sets him straight. Look in verse 18. I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family. Oh, you're going to go to my family, huh? You're the troublemakers, for you've refused to obey the commands of the Lord, and you've worshipped the false images of Baal instead. This guy is an absolute stud. I mean, Ahab could have killed anybody he wanted at any time, and Elijah stands in the face of this guy and says, I'm the troublemaker, you're the troublemaker. You've chosen to forsake God. It's incredible. You know the stories. Elijah would go on to challenge Ahab to this battle of the gods. The story of the, of the, uh, the offering that Elijah calls down fire from heaven. It's an incredible story if you, haven't, if you haven't read it. Toward the end of 1 Kings, Elijah brings on this understudy named Elisha. So you have Elijah and Elisha. Elisha would end up after Elijah dies. So when we get to 2 Kings, 2 Kings begins with the end of Elijah's life. And Elijah didn't die. The Bible says that the Lord caught him up in a whirlwind. And, 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 and so Elijah goes up to be with the Lord and Elisha would take the reins. Something that Elisha did was interesting that before he died, before Elijah, Elijah went up, he had asked Elisha, or Elijah, I'm getting him confused, Elijah, Elisha, uh, he, he had asked Elijah for a double portion of God's power in his life. And God would give it to him. And Elisha would do incredible, incredible miracles. Incredible miracles. In 2 Kings, in 1 Kings, the kingdom is divided. In 2 Kings, the kingdom is dissolved. The north, we read about 20 kings. All of them are evil. In the south, we read about 20 kings and 12 of the 20 are bad. In chapters 4 through 8, we read about the miracles of Elisha. The miracle of the empty jars in the widow's home. Elisha raises a little boy from the dead. Elisha multiplies the loaves to feed the people, kind of like Jesus did in the New Testament. And then um, 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 Elisha heals Naaman of leprosy. The next several chapters in 2 Kings 9 through 17, you see this cycle of good kings and bad kings. I want to point out, because this is really important, 2 Kings chapter 8. In verse 18 it says, But Jehoram followed the example of the kings of Israel, and he was a wicked king. He was as wicked of a king as Ahab, for he had married one of Ahab's daughters. So Jeroham did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah, for he had made a covenant with David and promised that his descendants would continue to rule forever. I have written next to that verse in my Bible, Messiah. That is where the line of the Messiah would come through. And in chapter 11, when Queen Athaliah takes the throne, we see that her son dies and she takes the throne in chapter 11, verse 1, and she kills the entire line of the royal family. But, look in verse 2, Ahaziah's sister, Jehosheba, another good name, the daughter of Jehoram, took Azariah's infant son, Joash, and stole him away from among the rest of of the king's children, where they were about to, 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 to uh, they're about to be killed. Um, down in verse, the next verse three, it says, Joash and his nurse remained hidden in the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled over the land. I have written next to that the line of David. 
This is the line where the Messiah would come through. So the Lord preserves this line of David through which the Messiah would eventually um, come through. In chapter 14, we're introduced to a man named Jonah, who we'll talk about here in just a couple weeks. In chapter 15, Azariah becomes king at age 16. He's also known as King Uzziah. And he was such an amazing king. He reigned for 52 years that when he died in the south, the people were completely flustered. What do we do? We finally got a good king. He's a great king. We are lost forever. There's no way that we can recover from this loss. And in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, that Isaiah saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is when Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord, and if to tell the people, I know your great king is gone, but I'm still the king. I'm still on the throne. I'm in charge. Chapter 17, Israel's, uh, the north falls to the Assyrians and the Assyrians would repopulate the north. In chapter 18, Judah falls to Babylon. The south falls to Babylon. And they have a very wicked king named King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember what he did, when he had conquered the south, he went into Jerusalem and kidnapped all the brightest and the youngest The first one being Daniel. Remember, he kidnapped them and brought them to Babylon. He he kidnapped Daniel. He kidnapped Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We'll learn about them in the book of Daniel. Chapters 18 through 25, the kingdom is completely dissolved. And this is a sad commentary because by the time we get to the end of Kings, God's people no longer inhabit the promised land. This is so sad because we've read this incredible story of all the miracles of the exodus and the plagues and the crossing of the sea and the, and, 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 and the crossing of the Jordan and all the miracles that God did. And they finally are able to inhabit their land. But they didn't do what God commanded. They kept worshiping false gods. And they didn't drive out all of the false gods like they were supposed to. And so the result is they they end up being separated in the north and the south. And then they're conquered by the Assyrians in the north. Conquered by the Babylonians in the south. And then we get to the end of 2 Kings and God's people are not in charge of their own land. They don't even inhabit their own land. God had warned them in Deuteronomy. That if you follow after false gods, you're going to lose everything that I provided for you. And this is exactly what happens. God gave them every opportunity to flourish. But they chose their own ways instead of God's ways. Let's wrap up with ordinary people with extraordinary stories. Three people. The first one is Elijah. Elijah, or excuse me, the first one is Solomon. Solomon goes from an inexperienced leader to the wisest leader who ever reigned. The next ordinary person with an extraordinary story is Elijah. Elijah goes from this small town prophet to a biblical icon. Remember in the New, Te- in the New Testament when the Pharisees were talking about Jesus and they talk about Nicodemus and, and they go to Nicodemus and they're like, do you, do you not know your own land? Like what? nothing good comes out of Galilee. No prophets come out of Galilee. And yet, this is where Elijah's from, so they didn't even know their own history. And yet God uses him in such incredible ways. And then the third is Elisha. Elisha goes from a timid understudy to a bold miracle worker that God used in incredible, incredible ways. The Midrash, which is a historical Jewish commentary, tells us that Elijah did eight miracles and Elisha did 16, exactly a double portion of what he had asked for. I want to wrap up with this. Ordinary people with extraordinary stories. God might call you or put you in a situation where he needs you to stand in the face of people going against the Lord. I hear all the time, pastors, Christians, all the time, I'm getting out of California. California is evil. It's so liberal. It's horrible. There's no place I would rather be, folks. Because do you know why? Light shines the brightest in the midst of darkness. 
God might want to use you to make a difference. You at your, you're at your job for a reason. You're in your neighborhood for a reason. You're where you're at for a reason. Don't be scared to be used by God. Don't be scared to stand up against the faces of darkness. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you're, you might be, think of yourself as an ordinary person, but you have the power of God within you, and God can use you in incredible ways if you allow him. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this incredible story. God, help us to learn from a lot of the things that we see in, in your word, that when we become self-reliant, when we forsake you, our life will never turn out the way that we want it to or the way that you have planned for us. No matter how strong we are, no matter how gifted we are, when we turn our back on you, we can do nothing. And so, Father, help us, Lord, to be filled with your presence, with your power, and not to be scared of the way our country's going, the way our state is going, but help us to be like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Help us to be willing to stand and be willing to be used by you. Father, thank you so much for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to New Hope this week. You know, the church doesn't stop when the video does. And make sure that you share this with a friend. You can even support what we're doing via the Give button here on the left. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single Sunday. And we cannot wait to see you this week, either in person or online. Have a great day.